All right, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to the book of Joshua, a type and shadow, where we are looking at um, various types and shadows in the book of Joshua, things that we can relate to, things that are symbolic, things that are, are uh, of a spiritual truth that we're seeing from very possibly uh, some literal events that took place in the Old Testament, but I'm more interested in uh, the allegorical meaning of what we're seeing. And so uh, we are discovering more of how the book of Joshua is filled with types and shadows of other things. We're seeing things such as the kingdom of God, the eternal Christ, and the finished work. Um, so as we look here uh, in the Old Testament, many people would not think that the book of Joshua or other Old Testament books would contain so much revelation of the eternal Father uh, at, that he declared uh, the end result about you from the beginning. So as we continue in this verse-by-verse -verse study, uh, it's important to look at all scriptures through the proper interpretive lens of Father's, which is Father's eternal love for his creation. Um, so my goal is to look and see what Father was telling uh, and was trying to reveal within a people long ago, even when he was interacting. And you have to see the Old Testament journey, the journey of people. He was interacting with them in their journey, uh, the journey of their human experience. So let's get started today as we dig deep into the well of Father's mind and see more types and shadows and symbolic messages from the book of Joshua. Let me say real quickly for everybody that's joining us, there's uh, Rita Alvarado uh, joining this morning. We appreciate you so much for watching. Um, and so uh, if you would, from the start, click like and then click share. I see my cousin Becky uh, from Oregon is uh, watching. Um, and so a long ways away, but uh, still watching on live on Facebook. So uh, let's get into this today. And everybody that's watching, everybody that's uh, just chiming in, uh, thank you so much for watching. All right. So as we look at the book of Joshua, we're going to start with uh, this is lesson only lesson number 11 out of the entire book. So let's look at Joshua chapter one. I'm sorry, Joshua chapter two, verse 11 through 13. And last week we were not on because I had a hard drive uh, uh, issue, but uh, got that straightened out. OK, so Joshua chapter two, verse 11 through 13 in the New King James says, and as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God of heaven above uh, and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will uh, show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token or this this really can say a token of truth and spare my father uh, my mother my brother my sister and all 
that they have and deliver our lives from death. So uh, as we've been talking about this chapter, uh, we see that the scenario is uh, simply that uh, they had heard about the children of Israel coming uh, across the, the desert and on their way from the uh, the bondage of, of Egyptian bondage for uh, 400 years. And we saw last time how that Rahab, um, Rahav in the Greek, uh, Hebrew, um, uh, that um, uh, says to the two spies, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, or the announcement of you, that it's gripped our hearts with fear, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Uh, and last time I uh, said, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites um, who were on the other side of the Jordan. And he tells about those and how they utterly destroyed them. Now you see a lot of death and destruction in the Old Testament. I mean, war was their way of showing dominance. War was their way of taking land and and grabbing possessions. Sometimes there were uh, good and healthy motives in terms of seeing bad elements, uh, kind of like uh, today when our cities are clean, the streets of our cities are cleaned up. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing, sometimes it's done right, sometimes it's done wrong. Uh, but here's the thing, they're hearing about the children of Israel and their, their victory at the Red Sea, uh, the, the victory over these two particular kings, and there were other things. And so I, I want to read to you from Isaiah 53, 1, um, uh, where we read a, a question, uh, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed or who, who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? Now, um, Isaiah 53, 1 in the Passion Translation says, who has believed, who has truly believed our revelation? So it's not just about our report, but it's our revelation. So let's take two things here. Number one, uh, think about the children of Israel as they cross the Red Sea. Uh, according to scientific studies, uh, an utter impossibility. But nonetheless, they crossed the Red Sea, and the Egyptian armies behind them were drowned, at least to some degree, and the rest retreated and went back. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you can look at that, and that would be a, a natural um, or a, a literal uh, perspective on this. But then you can look at the Passion Translation that gives us another uh, a layer of, of meaning, and it says, who has believed our revelation. Now, here's the beautiful thing, is you can, you can have fought the lion and fought the bear and killed the giant and won victory over drugs and won victory over over uh, alcohol and one victory over a variety of lifestyles and you can tell that testimony and, and that's good okay let me encourage you that's good but I love the passion translation just literally to say who has believed our revelation so what about the revelation of truth that where you used to be a person who would condemn and criticize possibly and then you go from that to a person who uh, gets a revelation of father's unconditional love for his creation and you begin to tell creation that they are loved by their God. What an awesome and powerful revelation that would be, and how wonderful it is to be able to uh, in, in, uh, to to openly share that revelation and minister to those who are hearing your words. Uh, so the the beautiful thing is is that as we read from the Passion Translation, Isaiah fifty three one, who has believed our revelation. To whom will Yahweh reveal his mighty arm? Now, one of the things we need to understand about God revealing himself, okay? Yes, God can reveal himself to you personally through dreams, through revelations, through visions. Uh, but also, God can reveal uh, himself to you through other people, just as God can reveal himself uh, to other people through you. Now from the Passion Translation footnotes of this verse, it says God's armor is a metaphor for his triumphant power. It is said that almost every verse in this chapter is alluded uh, to the New Testament reference in, in, uh, uh, in Jesus. 
And, and so I really think that that's such an important key that what we're seeing is a reference to Jesus in this new in this uh, uh, chapter of of Joshua uh, uh, chapter two, uh, the thing is that this would indicate what what was just said that the arm of the Lord uh, it reaching forth is a type of our I amness within that is reaching forth to someone. Now, is it God reaching forth? Yes. Is it you reaching forth? Yes. So the way to think of that is that it's you and God, not in tandem as in hooked uh, uh, side by side, but, but literally as one. You've been one since before the foundation of the universe, and you're still one. So the way I read that is I look at how that we were created as one with the eternal Christ, with the fullness of the Godhead in the beginning, in eternity past, even before Adam fell. So I'm not of Adam, I'm of God. But when you read Re Revelation chapter 22 and, and 21 and 22, you find out that the end is the same as it was in the beginning. Now the end is not the end, but more the end result of your journey. And so uh, what's, as we're looking at this today, the people of Jericho had heard about the great deliverances of God uh, for the people Israel. Uh, Joshua 11, uh, 2 verse 11, uh, this is the voice translation. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of other translations like we've been doing. I'm not saying we'll always do that, but in this case, we want to see this. He says, as soon as this news reached us, our hearts melted like wax, and none of us had one ounce of courage left. The eternal God, your God, is truly God of the heavens above and the earth below. So for the, the for a heart to melt uh, like wax seems to come from the word heart and the word melt comes from uh, the Hebrew word lavev, uh, lavav, uh, it wouldn't be a, it would be levav le or vav, levav, and vav is an important uh, symbol or a, 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 a syllable in the Hebrew language. And, and so if you're a student of Hebrew or Greek, these are just some nuggets as we go along. Uh, and, and it infers to the, uh, uh, refers to the uh, inner man of the mind, the will or soul or understanding. And then the word uh, uh, for uh, melt is the word masas. Uh, masas, uh, uh, used to as to dissolve or means to liquefy or faint with fatigue or as a weakness come upon them from within. Now we'll talk more about that, but here in, in the, uh, the uh, NET translation, um, let me look here uh, because I think this is the new uh, English translation, uh, says, uh, we heard the news uh, when we heard the news, we lost our courage, and we had, and, and no one could even breathe for fear of you. For the Lord your God is God of heaven above and earth below. So we have some similar wording, although a bit different. Uh, from the Hebrew language, it said that this uh, uh, that this would possibly read this way: as we heard, and our heart or our hearts melted, and there remained no longer breath in any man because of you. Now, you know, this wouldn't be like, uh, you know, lost your breath in terms of you got the wind knocked out of you and you couldn't breathe in that respect. But it would be like when you hear some really bad news and sometimes some even really good news. And at that moment, you feel weak in your legs and short of breath as if you could pass out. Except in this case, the news is very humbling and uh, caused great respect to arise within these people. Now the English word courage comes from the Hebrew word uh, ruach, ruach. This is the same word we use for spirit in the Hebrew. And it's used as wind, breath, mind. Uh, uh, and uh, it, when we use the English word uh, spirit, once again, this word is used ruach. And, um, you know, again, we get some very English, Western English enunciations of these words, but, but uh, being a college professor, it's important to learn to enunciate these words as best I can. Now, for me, I think this was Holy Spirit who breathed within the understanding of those in Jericho, which would be a type of spiritual revelation 
awakening within them of how great the God of Israel was. Have you ever been in a hospital situation? If you're watching today, you're a minister, uh, you're a, a pastor, a pastor's wife, or your wife is a pastor, you're the husband, or whoever you are. If you've been in any type of hospital situations where there's been a, a bad uh, scenario, even people who do not know uh, or understand the eternal Christ in them still at times will see a, a major victory, a major miracle take place and it will be a revelation type awakening within them of how great God is. Well, this is what happened to the people of Jericho. Uh, I think we looked at uh, a few lessons ago how they were uh, star worshipers or sun worshipers, I think it was. Uh, uh, but the fact is, is that, you know, you can be a, a worshiper of, of dirt and, and that be your thing. But you can, you can through that see a revelation of how great God is. God's the one that created the dirt or the sun or the stars and etc. Uh, moving on to Joshua 1 verse 12, this is again the voice translation. He says, because I know all these things, this is my request. All right, so Rahab is saying that, you know, hey, since I know that, you know, this is the the God, this since we've got a revelation here in this city and in my household that God is the only one, that the God of Israel that could have delivered you, I have a request for you. And it, she says, since I have treated you kindly and have protected you, please promise me by the, eter uh, by the eternal that you will do the same for my family. Give me some sign of good faith. So this sign of good faith might be viewed as a religious action on the part of Rahab, uh, but as far as, uh, and, and of course that might be true when we look at, um, uh, you know, this, this deal, deal making type situation. But as far as Rahab uh, knew sh uh, that if she got the spies to agree to this, this would be uh, as a verbal, verbally binding contract under Jewish custom. Now, uh, it, here's what we need to understand. They would keep their word, is what she was getting at. Uh, or like uh, the saying goes, my word is my bond. Uh, you'll hear that occasionally in the English, uh, in English phrases. Now, and this is what is known as a targum. Uh, in the Hebrew, a T-A-R-G-U-M, a Targum, which is defined as an ancient Aramaic phrase or interpretation of the Hebrew Bible and of a type made from uh, about the first century A.D. when the when Hebrew was declining as a spoken language. So if you had, you know, Hebrew didn't decline and move into the Greek language. Hebrew declined and moved into the Aramaic language. Sometimes uh, one of the things we're ignorant about or unlearned about, ignorant doesn't mean dumb or stupid, ignorant means unlearned. Uh, some of the things we're, un, uh, we're unlearned about is that <clears throat> there was not just the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek languages. Uh, there was Chaldean, and, and there, was, there was other languages, and I don't know all of them, but, but I, I focus on the things that really uh, we can relate to and we can learn from. And so from the Hebrew, this declining language in the first century comes the Aramaic, but there was also a Greek speaking people. And, and so they had certain customs. Now, to me, to swear by, uh, to, uh, to me, uh, here's what it means. Swear to me by the word of the Lord. And she did this by saying, since I have treated you kindly and have protected you. So it's almost like a bargaining chip, okay? It's almost like, uh, okay, look, uh, I really did protect you. I really did watch over you. So, you know, okay. So we see that because receiving them into, uh, uh, with peace into her house, uh, and hiding them, Rehav uh, risked her own life, and if discovered, could have meant trouble for her and her family. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, a covenant is a formal agreement between God uh, and the people of Israel uh, and Judah, uh, in which each agrees to a set of obligations toward the others. So even a word of mouth contract was very, very important. Now, while Rahab 
uh, does not live under the same mind as Israel, still covenant by word of mouth was just as valid and legally binding as it was uh, as a written contract would be in our day and time. Uh, the language of understanding of covenant was based on ancient Near Eastern treaties between various nations. So it wasn't just one. But you see, the Bible understands uh, 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 covenant uh, be, uh, from two different perspectives. One, the unconditional or eternal covenant between God and Israel or Judah, which is believed that the covenant can never be broken, although it does allow for divine judgment. Uh, and I'm giving you old Jewish law, old Jewish custom, Old Testament stuff, so, so, so please take it as is. Uh, we'll look at typologies as we go. Um, number two, the condition, uh, to the conditional covenant uh, means that the covenant might be broken if the people fail to comply with the divine will. But even conditional formulations of the covenant, such as uh, in Deuteronomy chapters 28 through uh, 30, presume that the covenant will be restored when Israel repents. So even when you're reading in Deuteronomy 28 about the blessings and cursings, keep in mind that they're covenant motivated or covenant related. Uh, so it isn't just that I can go there and grab and say, all these curses come on me if I'm disobedient, all these blessings come on me if I'm obedient. It had to do not with you, but with uh, Jewish law. Now, uh, both understandings we just talked about refer to the same covenant between God and Israel, but individual texts portray this covenant from different perspectives. Now, looking again at Joshua 2, verse 12, this is the New English translation. So now promise me this with an oath sworn in the Lord's name. Because I have shown allegiance to you, show allegiance to my family. Give me a solemn pledge. So first of all, the Hebrew uh, can render the, the first statement to read, now swear to me by the Lord. Now, I want you to notice something. The in other words here is that Rahab knew that to swear by an oath in the Lord's name would make the Lord the witness or guarantor, the one who guarantees it, of the promise attached to the oath. So if we made a covenant agreement in the Old Testament, under Old Testament law, uh, and, and we uh, uh, swore to that, or we committed to that uh, by the Lord or by the name of the Lord, what the deal is, is it would be binding uh, because it was a promise with an oath attached to it. The promise was what we agreed on. The oath was based on that God heard our covenant promise. And, you know, to a degree, I don't believe in being legalistic today or religious about it, but if I give my word to something, I already know that my father heard me and I will do my very best to keep my word. Now, again, there's the unconditional uh, uh, covenant and then there's the conditional covenant. And so even if uh, a person uh, gets into a situation where they just cannot do what they said they would do, at least tell the person and discuss it with them and make other arrangements. Now, if the person making the oath should go back on the promise, the Lord, uh, under the under Old Testament law or Jewish custom, the Lord would judge him for breaking the contract according to the Hebrew or Jewish customs, as I said. Now, a solemn pledge was considered a true sign, that is, an inviolable, inviolable um, uh, token uh, or pledge, one that, you know, you don't violate, okay? So Rahab says uh, that you will also show kindness to my father's house, meaning that not only for herself, uh, uh, and, but for her extended household. So it is said that Rahab uh, presses this issue by using the law of retaliation and friendship. So I want you to think about that. The law, this is another custom, the law of retaliation and friendship. You can Google that. It's it's actually uh, valid. Uh, since she had shown them kindness, uh, it was only reasonable 
Okay, so if you do a kind deed for me, it's only reason, for example, if you take me out to eat at a fine restaurant and you pay, it's only reasonable that the next time I should return the favor. Well, in this case, it was only reasonable that kindness should be returned. So Rahab uh, uh, actually um, um, uh, hides these men, these spies from uh, from Joshua and Israel's camp, hides them, and uh, then also uh, not only hides them, but uh, also takes care of them and and protects them, and uh, and 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 even lies to her uh, the, the the military uh, forces there when they're searching house to house. Now again, we talked about how that lie was looked at but uh, we're not going to go back there now here's the thing in the old testament there was a concept you've heard of this some of you probably live by this and i want to explain this in the old testament there was a, a custom called an eye for an eye you've heard that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth well it's also known as the law of reta retaliation uh and it was a, the principle that says that a person who is injured uh, has injured another person is to be uh, uh, penalized to a similar degree by the injured party. So you become responsible. So the intent behind this principle was to restrict compensation uh, to the value of the loss. Now we see that in uh, 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 at least courts in the USA today, uh, where you go to court, there'll be a claim over a property loss or uh, something of that nature, and the judge will try to find out what the value is of what you lost and give you at least uh, equal or greater compensation for your loss. So uh, Rahab uh, stood to lose not only her life, but all of her household, so that by rights, the, the governing structure there in Jericho could have come in and taken Rahab, and uh, also her whole household uh, acquired her, her, her living quarters and any possessions that she had. So she says, give me a true token or a solemn pledge so that she and her father's house would be saved by them when the city was to be taken over by Joshua and the children of Israel and the inhabitants destroyed. Now, according to some, this battle of Jericho reminds us that our enemy cannot be destroyed with physical weapons. And when I say our enemy, please understand that I am not of the persuasion of a literal devil or a literal Satan. Uh, that's not even how you say those words in the uh, the Greek or Hebrew language. And, and it's certainly what we've used for those words and define them in the English dictionary is not a Bible dictionary. Um, uh, you know, the closest you can get would be Webster dictionary. And even though Webster was a minister, still like James Strong, uh, didn't always get the words uh, 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 translated accurately. And so when I talk about an enemy, I'm talking about an enemy Enemy that that is the exact enemy of your unrenewed thinking now are there enemies that are other other people for example in the first century Pharisees were an enemy uh, they were always pushing the law on those young Jewish converts who were leaving the Jewish faith Judaism and moving toward the teachings of Jesus uh, so they became an adversary which is the meaning of what this word Satan or Satanas depending whether it's Aramaic or is Greek uh, means or devil diabolos uh, traducer one that traduces against you well another enemy they had was the Roman emperors of that day who demanded that they take a branding in their soul in their mind uh, in other words become convinced of their system so they could buy uh, food or sell uh, their crops and uh, and survive. Uh, so those were external enemies, but even those enemies had unrenewed thinking in them. Uh, and just as you and I have had unrenewed thinking in us. So this reminds us that our enemy within cannot be destroyed with physical weapons. You can't take a bow and arrow or a knife or a gun and destroy them. Uh, in that God goes ahead of those who are his uh, his uh, 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 that are his and fights for them uh, and that our victory is more than possible because it is promised 
So we're living by an oath. We, we call that covenant. It's a promise. It's an oath. It's covenant that God has done certain things on our behalf uh, from the time of creation. And now it's up to us to literally take them, run with them, or literally to uh, uh, follow through with what God has established. Amen. And so this is a very important aspect of this this particular scenario. Now, the, the same is, is allegorically true when it comes to overcoming the wandering, W-A-N-D, uh, the wandering thoughts within our own minds. Uh, so we talked about this for, before, but one of the most common, uh, most commonly known things about Jericho was that it was believed to be one of the oldest inhabited, inhabited cities in the world and the city with the oldest known uh, protective wall in the world. Now, it seems that walls are a symbol of spiritual or material protection in the Bible, but can serve as both to keep things out or in um, to keep things out or to keep things in. Now, I want you to think about that a moment. If you just kind of picture the wall of Jericho based on what you might have learned in Sunday school or what you might have read. When you take the walls of Jericho, think about the ability these great walls had, that they had chariot races on top of the walls. That's how, how massive the walls were. So that means at least one chariot would be able to pass the other. Now, Think about this, that those walls are designed to keep things out, but, but when they closed the gates of the city at sundown, those walls were also designed to keep things in, okay? All right, so when we talk about that, uh, when we're dealing with our own mental or soulish battles, uh, keeping negative thoughts out of our mind is only one part of this type of struggle, okay? The other part is getting negative or non-productive thoughts out of our mind. So sometimes there are things that seem like walls that are built up. And sometimes they seem like they're massive walls, that there's things that are trying to get in. We built massive walls. We won't let anything else in. Sometimes that can be extremely healthy. There are times that we need to let things in and embrace uh, truth that's being spoken to us. But there are times where it's very healthy. Now, there are also... Uh, think about these walls that keep things in. So if there's things you need to get out of you, they've got to go somewhere. Let's watch this. Rahab uh, risked her life for the safety of these two spies simply because she believed in their God. Uh, this doesn't say that Rahab, the prostitute, uh, was uh, a, a, a believer in totality, but she was new to this. But in some course in her life, some place in her life, she was coming to believe in the God of Israel. So there was a change in her life going on. Now, notice that Rahab pleads for her family as well as for herself. Or in other words, she is thinking outside the box or beyond uh, the walls that surround Jericho. Let's say it this way, that Rahab is thinking beyond her own religious walls, okay? She's going past selfishness. She's going past um, you know, self-promotion. Uh, she's going past uh, excluding other people. Uh, she saves the lives of the two spies, then believes that for saving, uh, for the saving of her uh, self and for her family. Now, notice what I just said. Uh, not only does she save the two spies, but she believes for the saving of of herself and her family. That's why this conversation is so important because what we're seeing in this conversation is Rahab is actually bargaining or she is uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, be a type of a savior in this situation uh, and speaking out uh, to find out, okay, hey, can we do something here? What's what's the custom? How can we deal with this? So now she did not bargain with them uh, before she hid them, okay? Uh, but she definitely positioned her household in a way that would identify her and save her uh, immediate family when the siege comes. Now, Looking at the final verse for today, uh, when we talk about Joshua chapter 2, verse 13, the voice translation says that when you destroy this city, you will spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sister, and their families from death. What's she wanting them saved from? From death. In other words, if we look at this in the literal sense, uh, 
there are uh, there are household members that we want to keep from being killed when uh, the city is attacked and overtaken. Now, here's the thing. You can also look at this allegorically in that there are some thoughts in your mind that you have uh, grown in revelation to that are foundational that you do not want to be uh, come uh, a target for destruction during the siege or the uprising of unrenewed thinking. Now, the reason I bring that up is because notice this, that Rahab makes no mention of any husband or any children, which would have been common for a harlot in that day. Uh, notice from Joshua 2, uh, 13 in the the, uh, the net Bible the uh, New English uh, translation says that you will spare the lives of my father mother brother sisters and all who belong to them and will rescue us uh, or rescue our lives from death now when Rahab knew that the inhabitants of the city were going to be destroyed uh, when it was attacked she provided uh, uh, she uh, provided for the safety of her family, similarly as Noah did in his day. Uh, let me give you a couple of scenarios. First of all, let's look at Hebrews 11 verse 7 that says, By faith Noah, being uh, divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, uh, 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 prepared an ark for the saving of his household, uh, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Okay? Now, as a type and shadow of these events, the soul or the mind has a defense mechanism that defends itself when attacked. Uh, for example, uh, it, it will even uh, 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 stoop to suspicion. So suspicion arises sometimes even about a change that is about to take place or that you can see forthcoming that will take place. Now, one of the things the mind does is that when we begin to hear things that are not uh, we're not familiar with, it doesn't make them true. What I say to my students at the close of every uh, class is uh, just because you heard me possibly say something or teach something today uh, that you've never heard before doesn't make it false or fake. It just means it's very simple. It just means you've never heard it before. And so just because you've never heard something before, it's very important that you realize and recognize that there are people who know things that possibly you don't know. It doesn't mean you don't know anything. It just means that we have learned some different things. And so in that scenario, when I hear something that somebody else is teaching, uh, I don't anymore but I used to get shook up. Uh, in other words, I would hear something that really sounds so far out there that it couldn't possibly be true. And sometimes it would take years to discover that it was true. And, and so what happens is, is that in my soul, a defense mechanism goes up and I begin to defend or begin to hold back uh, any new thought from trying to enter into my conscious mind. Uh, and, you know, not always successfully. Uh, but this is why the mind is referred to as the human rational soul. And it is, uh, it is practical uh, 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 of its own, um, uh, it is protective of its own state uh, and condition. And by nature, it is very solicitous or attentive, we could say, of the thoughts it embraces or rejects. Uh, within the thoughts of the mind, the Apostle Paul, he says something in Romans 9 verse 3 uh, that had to be something that arose from out of his subconscious mind. And, you know, if you study psychology and you study uh, uh, um, uh, the, the scriptures and you begin to learn how to interpret from a, a, a biblical psychological perspective, uh, you can almost see some scenarios uh, from the English scriptures that could very possibly be so. Uh, looking at uh, Romans uh, 9 verse 3 in the Passion Translation, Paul says, for my grief is so intense that I wish that I would be a curse or come under a curse. Cut off from the Messiah if it would mean that you, my people, uh, would come 
to faith in him. There's even a time in the book of Galatians where Paul refers to his people Israel. So it seems that Paul had such a passion for his people Israel to be saved um, that um, um, that or to be rescued from the law of self-effort and self-dependency that he says he would rather be a living uh, li living under a curse and be cut off from Christ if it meant that people would come to know Jesus now now of course we realize that the spiritual maturity of Paul knew that this was not the true path he would take yet he was only expressing his desire that I, I would gladly sacrifice this great thing in my life if it would mean that uh, uh, Israel could actually come to know the Lord, so to speak. So he was expressing his desire uh, for Israel to understand that they could truly depend on Christ within them as opposed to depending on uh, what the law had pushed them into, uh, self-effort, the demand of performance. Now, as it is with uh, 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 as it is with Noah, Paul, and or Rahab, uh, we see the need within the human form way of thinking for self preservation within. So this is what goes on in your mind, in your thinking. Uh, but we also see the spirit form way of thinking, also known as the God mind within, that sees beyond one's own uh, uh, self. Or, uh, and desire salvation for others. So Rahab's attitude did not seem to be my for and no more type of thinking. Uh, she was not satisfied only to save herself, but she also wanted to save her family or her household. And and you know one one translation says not only her family but but you know their households. So this could be children. This could have been grandchildren who are grown up, who are married have their own families this could have been quite a circle of people now keep in mind that Joshua had the job of clearing out the wandering tribes of Canaan so that Israel could have a home a permanent dwelling place so again I've shared this a few times uh, for me the wandering tribes are the uh, are an allegory for the wandering thoughts within the soul of mankind this should be the way we train our minds to think as we also embrace the Christ mind within. Uh, if there's anything I want to train my thoughts to do or train my mind to do, is the, and that is to give up or to surrender and think exactly like Christ thinks. So as we deal with our own thinking concerning the wandering thoughts within the unrenewed soul or mind, uh, we begin to think outside the box of limitedness uh, or, or, or limitless, li limitness, li limitedness, uh, and see a greater victory that we have experienced so far. Instead of only thinking about uh, about yourself each day, expand your thoughts to uh, something like this: How can I help someone else today? Uh, and do it because you believe that your Creator has uh, created you to manifest as visible and be a blessing to your family and others around you. Uh, look at, at, you know, as this lesson comes to a close today, I just want to say, uh, whatever you do today, if you're going sitting in a restaurant, having a cup of coffee, or if you're, you're uh, going to the grocery store, or you're going to church, or you're uh, going out on your front lawn, uh, let Holy Spirit lead you to be a blessing to someone. Amen. I want to make a quick uh, announcement. Uh, you can order these books. Go to Amazon.com. Search uh, Bishop Dr. B uh, Dr. Bill Hanshu. Um, and um, uh, this is my first book, Spread a Little Love, God's Love. It has some personal information. And I can see that my green screen is going wacky on me. Uh, let me straighten that up and I'll finish this advertisement. Uh, if I can get there, yes, yes, we're looking for my mouse in the snowstorm. That's funny. <laughs> okay, so um, all right, and 
and then secondly, uh, my second book, uh, Quotes of Inspiration from the Heart of God. Uh, you can also get that on Amazon. You can get these all of these books in uh, uh, paperback or in Kindle format. And then my newest book, the Book of Revelation, Unveiled Volume 1. This is the first five chapters of the Book of Revelation. It's not a thick book, but it's not a very thin book either. Uh, so it's about, uh, oh, I don't know. Let's see, I don't, I don't have page numbers, but um but anyway yeah so you'll enjoy it okay so just wanted to make you aware of those uh thank you so much for watching i hope you you really got something out of this lesson today if we look at the typologies the spiritual um uh you know uh, format of these various things that we're looking at uh, we appreciate and love all of you thank you so much for watching and uh we'll see you next time all right bye bye everyone sure.